1.3 of that 7 million being Palestinian Arabs. You can see one change that occurs in the demographics. The other change that occurred uh, is the rising proportion of the religious, the ultra-Orthodox, the religious nationalists in the Israeli population, <coughs> which has constrained the ability of Israeli governments, even if they want to make peace, to begin thinking of the compromises which would be necessary for that peace. If you look at the current coalition uh, that governs Israel, uh, the ultra-nationalist, uh, religious, the former Soviet makeup a very significant part of the con of that coalition and constrain its activities. Three, what do the Palestine papers show? Some of you have read about them in the newspaper. Uh, this leak that came out uh, that uh, the uh, Arab broadcasting company Al Jazeera, operating out of Qatar, was given a series of uh, uh, papers. The Palestinian side of the negotiations between uh, Prime Minister Olmert and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in 2007-2008. In what they show, from the point of view of the critics on the Palestinian side, is that the Palestinians were willing to give up too much. What they show from those who were looking for a settlement is that the Palestinians were willing to give up a good deal in order to get a peace. In other words, those papers show, and those of you who followed the uh, brief comments coming from Ehud Olmert's uh, uh, truncated uh, autobiography, which is coming out in parts, it shows that the Israelis and the Palestinians in late 2008 were very close to agreements, had looked for and wanted bridging proposals from the United States to bring them over that last hurdle. Several things happened, not the least of which Israel decided to go to war in Gaza. And uh, in short time, Ehud Olmert, who had already been brought up on corruption charges, charges with Israel, was no longer prime minister. Uh, that agreement, almost reached, disappeared. When negotiations were started up again, the new Israeli prime minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, said, no, we can't take off from where the Israelis and Palestinians had been in 2008. We have to go right back to the beginning. He was unwilling to accept the compromises which each had uh, given, and therefore uh, we're in a lot more trouble. Question four. Is an interim agreement, a conditional agreement, a partial agreement possible, and would it be useful? One of the things we've heard floated over and over again, particularly in recent days as well, they can't get a real agreement. <coughs> they can't come to a final uh, agreement on the exchange of territory, security, Jerusalem, refugees. <coughs> Can they come up with a conditional one? It's an important question, and probably the answer is probably not useful in that it would sustain the uncertainties and the instabilities that exist. <clears throat> One of the things that has happened through all of the negotiations from 1993 to today is that the settlement growth, as my colleagues pointed out, did not diminish. In fact, it increased. A conditional agreement would almost certainly allow that continued destabilization. Therefore, the thrust to say, if we don't get it now, it may become almost impossible, and we can't probably accept uh, conditional agreements. Uh, and five, finally, how do we assess uh, the, uh, no, excuse me, uh, uh, what impact will the Egyptian revolution <clears throat> have on Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking? <clears throat> All of us on this panel I know, have had that forefront in our mind. Those of you who immediately ask yourself, have you followed at all, what impact would you, you'd expect it to have an impact? And the question is, what does that impact uh, look like? What will it mean? Uh, I spotted something in the Israeli press in the last few days. The Israeli president, Shimon Peres, has said with some urgency, now is a time to reach an agreement with the Palestinians to at least keep stability on that front. Uh, we and the Palestinians have common interests. We know what the peace would look like. Let's move to a solution. Benjamin Netanyahu, fearful of his right-wing coalition, says no, and maybe his own beliefs, says no, we can't reach for a solution now. Uh, we have to keep all the territory we can hold on to because we believe that territory will be what we need for our own security. Uh, you can see then how uh, even within one government, 
the president and the prime minister, you have very different views. From the Palestinian perspective, there's also uncertainty. Uh, I'd say that generally, from the Palestinian perspective, if they could get a peace agreement now, they would take it. They would go for it with all of those compromises which they'd been willing to make with Ehud Olmert. Uh, in that, that would give them the stability to move into the future with some future to look at. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all very, very much. And I guess we need to have a digital clock up there, but we do have time for questions. Um, because we're so limited in time, I just, I saw your two hands and I will go over there immediately. Uh, because we're so limited in time, I'm going to ask you to really just ask questions and not make statements. But any statements you want to make, we can make in the Fenway room over some uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres or whatever. Um, I know that uh, Ellen Fitzpatrick is here someplace. Ellen, are you? If you could just flip on this, the, the population statistics. Um, just so you can understand a little, at least one of the arguments, uh, and uh, for a couple of minutes, and then go back and do the map with the settlements. And the settlement maps, the blue, the blue little things when you go to the settlements, you'll see uh, how many settlements there are, different sizes, some are large, some are not, and the reds are little outposts, they're supposed to be not quite as big. Okay, I saw questions over there, please. My question is to the panel. Uh, Define a bit more specifically what you mean by U.S. interests in Israel, and do any of you uh, believe that those interests potentially compromise the possibility of a successful negotiation? Uh, okay. Why don't um, uh, Steve? Do you want to try that? Maybe. Would you make? Would you? Um, the question is. Could you could you define more specifically what you mean by U.S. interests in Israel, and do those interests in any way? potentially compromise a, a, success, a successful negotiation. I'll take a swing at it. Others may want to chime in. This may be an issue where some people in the group disagree. I think the primary American commitment to Israel is a moral one uh, that, re that reflects the long history of Jewish suffering, primarily in the Christian West, and the belief that, uh, that Jews deserved a state of their own like others. Um, and that that is the primary basis for the American commitment there. Uh, I personally don't see a conflict between what I think American interests are and protecting that particular commitment. I actually believe a, an American policy that was less unconditional support and treating Israel essentially like the way, same way we treat other democracies would both be better for the United States but also better for Israel because I believe the course that Israel is currently on is not in its own long-term interest and is threatening its own long-term future. Others may disagree with me there, but I think that's what the American interest is, and I think the policies that we've laid out together in our joint statement would actually be good for the United States but also good for Israel. Please. Uh, I have a question directed to uh, Professor Kelman, if that's all right. Okay, we we'll uh, I'm actually a skeptic of the idea of uh, two states being established successfully at the, at the time. Uh, I noticed in one of your uh, recent papers on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict that uh, you supported the idea back in like, the 40s of a uh, singular binational state. And I was wondering about um, why, this, uh, why you supported that at the time and uh, why that still wouldn't work today. Thank you. Well, I supported a binational state in the 1940s, uh, when uh, most of you were not alive. Uh, I, I, I think the situation has, you know, that was before the creation of Israel. I think right now, uh, a binational state is simply not in the offing. I think the formula, the call for a, you know, a one-state solution, uh, whether it's a binational state or a... Um, unitary state, you know, the one person, one vote kind of situation, uh, is simply, under the present circumstances, a formula for continuing the conflict. The only way we can resolve the conflict at this particular historical juncture is to provide for each of the two peoples the opportunity to express their national identity in a state of their own. Uh, my own feeling is, you know, I, I have sort of a new formula which I call maybe that's what you read somewhere, uh, the one country, two state solution, where we think of the country as a unit, that whole, not a political unit,
but as a psychological unit and in many other respects as a unit. For example, uh, a unit in which there can be joint economic activities, cultural activities, cross-border experiences, etc., etc. But politically, politically, I think there need to be two states, two independent states at this point. How that will evolve over the over generations, uh, I, I would leave to history. Please, and then we'll. I'm I'm trying to. Yeah, please go right ahead. Two things you did not cover: Would Palestine be viable economically, and would Hamas serve to stabilize the country? Richard, why don't you try that? There's no question. There's no question that the state would require significant economic assistance, developmental assistance. And there are complicated questions in terms of ensuring that Palestinians are able to get their goods to market. For example, you have a significant segment of the economy right now which is still devoted to agriculture, and, um, and uh, those producers cannot get their crops to market in many cases because they're impeded by Israeli security regulations and so on. So there are complicated problems to be solved, but I see those as technical details. I think with an agreement that has significant regional acceptance, and we do have in the so-called uh, Saudi proposal of 2002 a framework which pretty much squares with the Clinton parameters and so on, I do think that can be worked out. Uh, the other question, what was the other question? Hamas. Hamas, Hamas. yes, big question. Um, look, Hamas is a nationalist group. It's an Islamist group. And they have uh, said at various points, and I, I think authentically so, that uh, they are prepared to engage in at least a long-term ceasefire with Israel. And that ceasefire might be 20 years, 25 years, or 30 years. Uh, are they willing to go a step further, which is to say to actually embrace a peace treaty? And that is a question. That is a significant question. In the former negotiations, which is to say during the Oslo period, Hamas in effect said to Fatah and Arafat, we don't think what you're doing is going to work, but go ahead and try. And I think that at the end of the day, and this is more hunch than evidence, that we would see a fairly pragmatic response from Hamas if there is a reasonable deal on the table. And just one quick point. When Hamas won the Palestinian elections in 2006, uh, there was significant expert opinion in the U.S. government, including the CIA, which basically urged Bush to try and work with these people incrementally. And Bush's response was initially positive. And then he changed his mind, and of course, we set out trying to isolate and undermine Hamas. Um, so some of their behavior has to be understood not in a vacuum, but in the context of the policies that they have been the brunt of, as well as their own actions and terrorism and so on. So I, I think, frankly speaking, that they can be brought, if not to the table, to a supporting role. But, you know, it depends on whether or not the agreement looks like a reasonable one, whether or not the settlements are largely erased and so on, whether or not these economic viability questions can be addressed, et cetera. I, I'd like to just add one thing to the Hamas question, and, and that is that um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian uh, president, has said that uh, any agreement reached in negotiations would be put to a referendum of Palestinians. Um, there's a question of exactly who would vote, but in any case, if you had an overwhelming approval, it would be very hard for Hamas to go against that public expression of approval. That, that's what I was going to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that puts it into perspective. Just